bringing this particular series of prayer to an end. I want to share with you tonight learning to pray from Daniel. Um, I suppose if you think of Daniel, many things would come, perhaps uh, God preserving him from the hungry lions, uh, his friends from a fiery furnace. But the thing that probably should stick out in your mind is that he was a man of prayer. Daniel 9, 3 and 4 says, And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. You perhaps recognize prayer and supplications is basically asking and begging. So it's, it is talking to God, but it is very earnest. And then with fasting, so uh, he's not stopping to eat. Sackcloth means he's wearing burlap, a, a sack cloth, so that it's all itchy. And he's dumped ashes on his head. Why would he do that? Because it made him feel uncomfortable. Um, we have supplanted sackcloth and ashes with wooden pews. So uh, as you feel uncomfortable tonight while you're praying, you recognize you don't have to wash it off later. So that's good. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. <clears throat> what an introduction to the prayer. Recognizing he <clears throat> is not a God to be played with, even though we can talk to him any time in any place. <clears throat> to Jehovah my God made my confession. We're going to read later that he not only confessed his sins, for this personal interview with God, but talking about releasing Israel from their captivity, which is what he was praying about. Um, he also confessed his father's sins. Now, this was a national chastisement, and he was, you know, literally connected racially to, to these people, so he was confessing their sins. He was, you know... How do you confess somebody else's sins? Well, he was acknowledging they were wrong. He was not defending them in what they had done. Um, so sometimes we, presenting our nation before the Lord, will confess that they are doing wrong things. We will not allow our patriotism to defend uh, wickedness when it is being done. So we can say the book of Daniel presents an amazing demonstration of working by prayer, God actually uh, doing a work, but waiting for somebody to pray, and Daniel was the one. Daniel's experiences provide undoubted evidence of the importance of prayer, and this is a challenge, and perhaps the challenge to believers today. The secret of Daniel's success at every level is clearly his life of prayer. So he had mastered what has been the theme of, uh, of, of this series, the secret of working with God by prayer. Let's look first of all then at the character of his praying, <clears throat> prayer practices. Daniel learned the value of a regular time and place for prayer. He was systematic. He was methodical in his prayer life. <clears throat> at the time of John Wesley, he boiled everything down to practices, to duties. And uh, so he would, he had his methods. And uh, so that's why they started calling him a Methodist. Uh, he had his methods. He would pray regularly. He would read the Bible regularly and so on. Well, Daniel uh, was a Methodist here. He learned the value of regular time, systematic, methodical in his prayer life. In Daniel 6.10, you remember when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, that you were not to make any request of a god or anybody else except for the emperor. He went into his house, 
and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. When it became illegal, and he, one of the high-ranking officials of the government, he knew that they would be looking for him. He said, I would far rather offend them than God, and I will not change my pattern. So three times a day, uh, he was on his knees, and he was taking a special time of prayer. So notice here, Daniel played and prayed in the same place every time. There is a value to this. We've mentioned this before, talking about having our devotions. Um, yeah, my, my devotions very often are just sitting at my, my desk in front of my computer, and my Bible is, is on, on the screen. I'm doing Bible study that way. I can look up meanings of words and trace them down all through the scripture and so on. It's a very valuable way for me to do a, a Bible study. But um, it, it has become a sacred place, a place of study, a place of preparation, a place of prayer, a place of, uh, of devotion. And coming there, sitting there, uh, tends to put me into the mind of doing the work. My wife will sometimes come in and say, are you still working at this? And I don't realize that the time has gone by because my, my thoughts are absorbed by this. Um, now, remember that he chose this room. I don't know if he chose his place of living uh, or was assigned it, but he, he found a room that faced the windows faced Jerusalem. One of his windows opened toward Jerusalem. That's where he prayed. When King Solomon dedicated the temple, he asked God for a favor. And uh, perhaps you'll remember this, 1 Kings 8, 46 to 50. In this dedication, he's talking, uh, Solomon is talking to God. If they sin against thee, for there is no man that sinneth not, <laughs> if they sin against you, and they will, and thou be angry with them, and deliver them to the enemy, so that they carry them away captives unto the land of the enemy, far or near. He says, if it happens, like you said it was going to in Deuteronomy, and of course it did, and Daniel is there in that faraway place, yet if they shall bethink themselves in the land, whether they are carried captives, and repent, and make supplication unto thee in the land of them that carried them captives, saying... We have sinned, we have done perversely, we have committed wickedness, and so return unto thee with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies, which led them away captives, and pray unto thee toward their land, toward Jerusalem, toward the, the land of Judea, <clears throat> which thou gavest unto their fathers, and the city, Jerusalem, which thou hast chosen, and the house which I have built for thy name. So that would be the temple, you see. When, then hear thou their prayer and their supplication in heaven, thy dwelling place, and maintain their cause. This is that, uh, to me, a fascinating concept. And then verse 50, he goes on, he says, And forgive thy people that have sinned against thee, and all their transgressions wherein they have trans transgressed against thee, and give them compassion before them who carried them captive, that they may have compassion on them. He says, let them be different because they show compassion as you have had compassion on them. Well, Daniel was one that they took note of. And uh, you remember the very reason that they came up with this thing was that uh, they checked all of his dots and dotted his I's and crossed his T's and he checked all of his his financial records and everything and he was he was absolutely righteous he was not trying to cheat anybody he was a servant he was dedicated to getting this work done even though he was in a pagan land for serving a pagan king so they said if we're going to 
catch him on this, we're going to have to catch him in his religion because he is unvarying in that. So that's what they did. And he said, well, then catch me because I'm not going to change. But here he says, here I am, Lord, tucked away in Babylon, looking toward my land that you gave to the fathers, to the city on the hill, Jerusalem, and to the temple that you allowed Solomon to build, and I am calling upon you. And um, so he was careful. Now, he also prayed three times a day. Uh, this is not just the kind of prayer that we do as we're walking along and we see something, and oh, Lord, help them. This was actually going to a, a, a place of prayer and a time of prayer, a season of prayer. So uh, he put into practice the goal of King David, Psalm 55, 17, evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. Now, we don't know the times that Daniel prayed, but if you're going to have three sessions of prayer, surely one of them will be in the morning, one around noon and one in the evening before you go to bed. With his busy schedule, because he was, um, you know, a person with a lot to do, uh, he must have been tempted to cut back on prayer. But he resolutely refused, think of this, to let other duties rob him of his time with God. How quick we are to do that. Well, I, I should pray, but I, I don't have the time. You don't assign the value to that time of prayer. Daniel did. And then he prayed with others. I find it uh, fascinating studying through Daniel to find that it's in the book of Daniel. We find the first example of group prayer. Probably happened before, but we don't have it in the Bible. It's Daniel 2, 17 and 18. <clears throat> he has gained the delay for the killing of all the wise men, which would have included him because he and his friends were student wise men. Um, and he says, we got to pray. So Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Do you know their other names? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Abednego. And uh, Jude was saying, what was their funny names? I said, oh, you mean my shack, your shack, and to bed we go. Yeah, that's not really their names. But that was the funny thing that people said. But their beautiful Jewish names, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, flows off the tongue. His companions, his pals. He made the thing known that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning the secret that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. They had revealed to the king that they didn't know what the gods think. They didn't know what his dream meant. They interpreted dreams, but he had to tell them the dream. See? So um, he says, no, you, I want you to tell me the dream. Then I know that you have supernatural understanding of what it means. So they prayed, and God did give them that, that vision. Then I want you to see the prayer elements. <clears throat> So what my point about praying with others, we're doing that tonight. We're praying with others. Uh, this is, uh, prayer time doesn't have to be just you and God. Although at some point it should be, but uh, it's not all the time that. What are the prayer elements? Well, first was reverence. Uh, this wasn't a joking time. It wasn't a haphazard time. Daniel 6.10, now when Daniel knew the writing was signed, he went, upon, uh, he went into his house and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed. If you understand this, the bowing of the head, the closing of the eyes, the folding of the hands, the, uh, the bending down, the kneeling down, all of this is to signal with our body the humbling of ourselves before God. Uh, I've mentioned before, if uh, you mind standing up, Olivia. Uh, now, 
if you if you go like this, does it make you kind of feel a little humble and a little lesser than? But now I want you to rear your shoulders back, put your hands on your hips, <laughs> stick your chin out. Now, how do you feel? <laughs> I just feel silly because I'm making you do this in front of everybody. But that attitude, this is not how you would pray. And you can, you can feel the difference in your body. Thank you. Let's get ready. Well, well done. Great acting. We move our bodies to teach our soul so that it corresponds to the way we're feeling. You see. <clears throat> so he knelt. Secondly, and I try to humble myself without kneeling because it is terribly painful and I can hardly get back up. So I don't do that anymore. But reverence was number one. And then earnest persistence. Uh, he didn't give up. Daniel 6, 11, these men assembled, found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. So they saw him from the window, evidently. He's back at it. I want you to think of what went on there. He continued while his enemies watched him praying, then organized their group, called in the people, and then entered his home. So this was not a uh, God bless the missionaries, thank you, and, and he was done. This was, this was a time of prayer, earnest persistence. So Daniel 10, 2 and 3, in those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. In the Hebrew, weeks of days here, because earlier he's used the term weeks in a prophetic way of talking about weeks of, of years. But here are weeks of days. I ate no pleasant bread, um, and, and uh, bread can be just food. Neither came flesh, meaning meat or wine in my mouth. Neither did I anoint myself at all. That was how you washed yourself up, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. He says, I was just my own stinking self for three weeks, not eating, uh, not drinking anything, probably but water. So uh, here is a time when he was really wanting an answer from God. And we'll notice how God answered in a moment. But, uh, but this is earnest persistence. If you ever are in a place where you recognize you have to get God to do something about this situation, that you are not willing to continue without God doing this, then you learn to fast. Uh, you have to be careful with your doctor's orders and stuff. But most of us don't have to have food at a regular basis. And um, when you fast, you teach that body action, teaches your soul that what you're doing in the spirit is far more important than your food. The hunger itself becomes incorporated into the dedication that you uh, have in your prayer. Um, if you were to fast three weeks, uh, I fasted a, a week once, and I found that uh, the actual desire for food, the hunger for food, kind of went away about three days, and uh, you just felt like you were coasting. Your body changed over from, from the sugar that you take in to start feeding on the fat of the land, if you understand what I mean, the, the, uh, uh, the stored energy that we have. And with that then, the uh, time of prayer and, and stu Bible study and so on was extended because you didn't have to interrupt for food. Not only reverence and earnest persistence, but we find with thanksgiving, sometimes we can be so concerned about the problem, 
so concerned about the difficulty. We're ready to weep and not give thanks. But we have to get our mind around that, where we actually thank God for the problem, thank God for being the God who has allowed it, or we, it, it doesn't open us up to uh, an understanding of how these things are. Daniel 6.10, Now when Daniel knew the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did it four times. He wasn't thankful for these people that were trying to get him killed. He was not thankful that they would pass a law that says you can't pray. But he was thankful to God. Rejoice, the Lord is king. Now, don't be deceived into thinking that was a thing for Daniel alone. God teaches us this today. Philippians 4, 6. Be careful, full of care. Be worried for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 and 18. Pray without ceasing in everything. And so while that would include the great weather and beautiful color of the trees and rejoicing in all of that and thanking God for that. It also is thanking God for the trials, for the problems, for the difficulties, for the pains. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. These words indicate that if you want to please God, you have to get into the place where in your prayer you're thanking him for the very thing that you're asking him to take away. Number four, a spirit of confession. Daniel 9.20, And whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my, of my God, um, presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. He was presenting his is begging and uh, confession this is this is clearing the conscience this is washing your hands before you speak to God this is cleaning yourself up before you appear before God's presence and here because he's dealing with the entire nation he's admitting the sins of his people Alexander White January 13th 1836 to January 6th 1921, my, my mother was one year old. As Scottish preacher, he once told a small crowd that he had found out the most sinful man in Edinburgh and had come to tell them. We have to change to the next screen to find out who it was. He leaned forward and whispered, his name is Alexander White. You live with yourself. You think those thoughts. You know where the impurities might be. So don't try to put on a mask of perfect holiness. Strike up your little halo before you go to prayer. He can't fool God. He absolutely knows everything about you. The problem is you don't, we don't. So let's exercise that and be who we really are and confess that. So a spirit of confession. And then expectancy. Remember back when the wise men were going to be killed, Daniel told King Nebuchadnezzar that he would make known the dream and its interpretation to him before he had received it from God. Before he had got the answer from God. He said, I'll give it to you. I don't know, maybe he thought, what's he going to do, kill me? It's going to happen anyway, right? So I'll just, I'll just say that God's going to do this. But he was praying with expectancy. Let us pray with faith, believing. <clears throat> I want you to see in Hebrews 11, 6, God wants this. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God 
must believe that he, that God is, that God exists, and notice this, that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, that he answers prayer. We don't pray to hear ourselves talk and to stir ourselves up psychologically. We're actually talking to a, a real being, one who can do whatever we ask, but will do whatever is right. And he says, if you want to come to God, and that, that's what we try to do in prayer, you have to believe that he is. You're talking to a real person, a real being. And you have to believe that he's the rewarder of them that diligently seek him, that you can get what you're asking for. And then I want you to see, in the third place, the prayer basis. <clears throat> We saw how Solomon had asked, that, asked God that any who pray toward the temple might have their prayers answered. Daniel prayed facing Jerusalem because he was biblical. Um, he was studying the Bible as he had it. Part of this was a man who was not that far removed in time from him, Jeremiah, and his writings. Now, he didn't have it in a book. He had it in papers. No, books would be scrolls. Daniel 9, 1 and 2. In the first year of Darius, or Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of of Jerusalem. Now this man was over 70 years, Daniel was over 70 years, and he remembers what he, when he was brought in, and uh, now he spent his entire life into his agedness, and has been in this, this place, and he says, I think it's been 70 years. So he is going to God to say, oh, let it be now. There was actually three times that the took people away from Israel. And um, so he's praying that, uh, oh, this, you know, let it be fulfilled, let it be 70. And if you notice, there was three times that God allowed people to return. Uh, interesting parallel. First John 5, 14 and 15, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, this is why we try to live in such a way that we're living according to his will. We are trying to please God because then as we do that, then the things that we're going to ask, the things that we're going to desire will be things that he would be pleased with. And so he says, if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And this is not a hearing like God noticed that you were saying it because God notices everything. God sees everything. But he's using it in a, a kind of a court term to give, give you a hearing. He says, and if we, we know that if he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we desired of him. You go to the court with a petition, but the court won't hear you. It doesn't give you access to speak to the judge. You don't get what you're asking. But if he hears you, and it says, in this case, if God gives you a hearing, he's going to answer with a yes. So that's wide open. I mean, he says, anything. If we ask anything, whatsoever we ask, we know we'll have it. So it has to be according to his will, not our will. We're not asking to serve it on our own lusts. All right, the second thing here is the cost of his praying. He would pray even at cost to himself. His personal purity. As a young man in Babylon, he determined not to defile himself. I mean, who's going to criticize him? Who's going to know? Who's going to, but he knew, and God would know. So he said, I don't want to eat the food that God said I can't eat. And um, perhaps because... There's no distinction between the wine that was served in Babylon and the wine that was served in, 
in Israel. I don't know, you know, any any reason why their wine would be any different. But I think it was just that it was all dedicated to their gods. It was all tainted in his thinking. So he says, well, I'm going to become a vegetarian, and uh, I'm going to uh, just eat the seeds and that type of thing, drink water. Personal purity. He was not going to be defiled. And then official faithfulness. When he had a job in a pagan country, he said, God has given this to me, and I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. I'm going to fulfill everything that I can in his work as an official of more than one government. <laughs> this is the thing that they overthrew the government, but they said, let's get that guy that worked so well with the last government. Let's get him in here. Daniel was exemplary in uh, Daniel 6, 7. Then the presidents and the princes sought to find an occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could, not find, they could find none occasion nor fault, for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. And then allegiance to God, the very reason he was sentenced to the lion's den was that he would not compromise his allegiance to God. He would not say, I'll put it on hold until the law gets passed. Third and finally, the consequences of his praying. One was personal deliverance. He delivered himself and his friends along with the rest of the unbelieving wise men when he received the dream and its interpretation from God. So God delivered him from his punishment by the lions for faithfully praying. This, when they caught him praying, the sentence was to be thrown into a den of lions. And God personally delivered him. I think we can count on God wanting a praying person to continue. Secondly, divine revelations. God gave Daniel revelations that still thrill and challenge our understanding today. Daniel 9.22, And he, the angel that appeared to him, informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. I don't expect to ever actually talk to an angel. God's pretty well handled all that with the completed word of God. But uh, how exciting would that be? We heard you praying. God sent me to give you an answer. Wow. And that brings me to the last one, that is angelic activity. If you think about angels as the messengers of God, and you read in the scripture... We don't see angels. They're, they're beyond our ability to see and hear and touch. But they're active and they're, they're busy and they're doing all kinds of things. They're, they're um, influencing and, and protecting and so on, unseen. Um, I think they're busy today. I think they are with us. They're protecting us. If you've had unusual situations where it looked like something bad was going to happen, and suddenly it just didn't happen. I think that's an angel. I can't prove that, but um, uh, it's happened so often to so many people that I've heard of, uh, even to, to where a car seemed to levitate over a situation, and they look back and they don't know how they got through that. Uh, and these were, not, these were not drinkers. These were... <laughs> These are solid Christian people who experienced it. Daniel's prayers set the angelic world into motion. Daniel 9, 22 and 23, And he, the angel, informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, three weeks before, the commandment came forth. I was told by God to come to you three weeks ago. Wow. Wow. Is heaven that far away? It takes three weeks for you to get here. He says, At the beginning of thy supplication, the commandment went forth, I am come to show thee that thou, for thou art greatly beloved, therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. He says, A funny thing happened on the way to Daniel. Another demon came up and resisted me. I've been fighting him for all this time. Finally, Michael had to come, take over the fight, let me slip out so I could get here. Sorry I'm late. <clears throat> But he kept on fasting, he kept on praying, not knowing that an angel was fighting uh, 
I was going to say life and death, but I don't even know if that's possible for angels. But anyway, they were fighting a, a dread demon trying to get there. So let us learn. Shall we, in fact, learn from Daniel? Shall we give ourselves to consistent, faithful prayer? Daniel was known as a believer. He was the one who made known Jehovah God to a pagan land. He was the one that said, we found out that we can't burn them, we can't have them eaten by lions. He had a reputation. He, uh, he seemed to live beyond the lifespan of, of most of the Babylonians who only lived into their 50s, statistics tell us. Uh, he was well into his 80s, perhaps twice the lifespan of some of them. And uh, God held him up as an example. That was because he was a man of prayer. Comments or questions?